you worship the Lord. And I pray that you would do that with the depths of your heart. Don't let it just be a formality, but with the depths of your heart. When they get done at a certain point, Chris White, who spoke to you guys earlier today, is going to come up and give the word. And I want you to hear him. But more importantly, I want you to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say. What he's going to say to your heart tonight is, we're here on this retreat for this moment. Let's pray. Lord, God, I pray right now in this place that you would be glorified, that we would lift you up from the depths of our heart. It wouldn't be just from our lips, but it would be from our heart. And I pray you would open the ears of our hearts to hear what the Spirit has to say to every person that's here. We shove everything to the side to give you center stage. In Christ's name, amen. This is amazing
of Christ and um, I'm sitting on the front row at the church and I knew a lot about Jesus but um, <laughs> right here nice I'm coming over here in the guitar section nice We'll see if you uh, see if you're correct. So uh, this guy goes into graphic detail about the crucifixion of Christ. My heart explodes in my chest. Um, I don't know if you've ever had one of those ugly cries, but I had an ugly cry moment where I'm like it, <coughs> that kind of a cry, and I got up and I ran down the center aisle of the church, went outside. And I'm holding on to one of the, the columns that's outside of the church. And uh, at the time, I was dating this older chick. She was seven. And she, she came out to check on me like a good uh, girlfriend does. And I couldn't even talk to her. I was crying so hard. She was like, what's going on? What's wrong? What's wrong? And I'm like, oh, 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 oh. And I just couldn't tell her. And, you know, back in the day, you know, nowadays we put pastors up in hotels and stuff. But back then, uh, they stayed in the pastor of the church that invited them. And so he was in our house, and that afternoon, my family always took a Sunday afternoon nap. He came into my room, and he said, Chris, I saw you run out of church this morning. Is God working in you? And I said, yes, sir. And uh, he said, do you understand that you have broken God's law, even at the age of six, because you're born separated from him? not to count all the stuff you've willfully done wrong? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, do you want to trust Christ with your life and let him forgive you of all your sin and he can come and live inside of you and make you new and live with you forever? And I said, yes, sir. That's what I've been telling my parents I want to do, but they think I'm too young. So we knelt beside my bed. I prayed and I asked the Lord into my heart and I remember being in my dad's long white t-shirt and my underwear and I just ran through the house going, I'm saved, I'm saved. Woke the whole house up, man, I was super excited. But I was never discipled. So at the age of 12, uh, I'm drunk the first time. I'm hanging out with friends that are 14 who have brothers that are 18. I was born in Alabama, grew up in Mississippi, and back then the legal drinking age was 18. So all you had to do was have an 18-year-old with you. And so they thought it would be cute to introduce a 12-year-old in sixth grade to Jack and Coke. And for the first time, I discovered what it was like to be drunk. Now, keep in mind, these are all my church friends. This is the worship pastor's son and older son. These are deacon's kids. And, and by the way, when you hang out with deacon's kids, man, they'll really jack you up. So I, I, I'm going to church. I'm doing the church thing. I know I gave my heart to the Lord when I, was, when I was six, but I didn't know how to live for him, and I wasn't discipled. And so I began to do the things the world said to do, and I carried on through middle school. Tenth grade was my absolute worst year of ever. Um, got in trouble with the law, went in front of a judge, got in big trouble, and uh, it continued right out of high school. I went in the military and man, the military just continues that whole party lifestyle. And so I'm, I come home from the military. I'm two weeks away from being 21 years old. I've had a fake ID that said I was 23 from the time I was 15. Never questioned any time I went and bought alcohol. And I'm at a party. I'm about three beers in and I'm just looking around the room. It's loud. It's smoky. All my friends are kind of, you know, hooked up in the corners with their girlfriends and whatever. And I'm just looking around the room. And back in back in the '80s, when I grew up, there was this there was this beer commercial, uh, and and it was basically a bunch of rocked out dudes on the side of a mountain around a campfire with girls in fuzzy bikinis and six packs floating down on little parachutes. Sounds totally ridiculous, like total '80s, right? And the tagline in the beer commercial was, life just doesn't get any better than this. Some of you might be old enough to remember that. So I'm sitting at this party, 
And I'm, you know, catching a little buzz and I'm, I'm looking around the room and I'm thinking of that tagline in this commercial. Life doesn't get any better than this. Life doesn't get any better than this. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, man, I've been doing this since I was 12. This is old news. If it doesn't get any better than this, I quit. And something snapped inside of me. I had gone far enough from God that he allowed me to taste what it was like to try to do life without him, having truly already given my life to him, but not knowing how to walk with him. And I put that beer down, I got in my car, I drove home, I shouldn't have, I was buzzing, but I drove home, I got it myself in my room, I locked the door and I got on my knees. And for the first time, I was a little kid. I began to cry. You know, I'm a tough dude. I was a middle linebacker in high school. Loved to knock snot bubble out of people. Thought I was tough, macho man. But man, I just began to cry like a baby. And I said, God, I know that I gave my heart to you when I was six. But I hadn't lived a day for you since then. And I don't know how to live for you. But if you can do anything with my life, you can have what's left of me. I quit. Just don't leave it up to me to try harder or to be better or to, to do something different. Because let me, I don't know if you, this be, might be you, but let me just tell you, I knew where I was and I knew where I needed to be. But I didn't have the want to to get from here to there. Anybody here that way? And so I think the Spirit of God revealed to me in that moment to pray something similar to this and I just said God I need you to create within me a hunger and a thirst for you that will drive me to you all the days of my life because if you leave it up to me to try harder I don't I quit and so I fell asleep on the floor can y'all hear me without this no you can't no. not really well you just answered me well, you know, not well enough. Not well enough. All right. Not well enough. Not well enough. All right, so it's going to... Uh, 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 this all night. Um, back up again. Get into the window. I'll sit in the window. All right. We'll see. I think it might, it might have a compressor on it so that it clips when you get to a certain volume. I don't know. So anyway, I'm praying this prayer. I fall asleep on the floor. I wake up the next morning. Now listen, I've been told to, to, to read my Bible and to pray every day of my life. I've sat next to my mom while she knew I was partying. And on Sunday morning, I'm hung over and I'm sitting in the pew next to her. And she's running her bony little finger on verses trying to get me to pay attention to it. But for whatever reason, God answered that prayer that night. And that next morning, I had this crazy desire to find my Bible. And so I did. And I, I found it. I dusted it off. And I began to read it. And I was captivated by it. I couldn't put it down. And this is not an exaggeration. For the next two years, I spent on average two to six hours a day reading the Word of God. Here's the problem with that. When you get into the Word, the Word gets into you. And it turns a spotlight on your life and it exposes everything that is not of God. And he began to sift my life of my music and my friends and the things that I was doing, the places I was going. Even in AA, they teach you uh, places, uh, playthings. You got to get rid of those things. You got to change those things. People, places, and playthings. You got to go. You got to have a complete change. And so God just kind of stripped my life of everything. And I went without friends for two years. Nobody wanted to hang out with somebody that wasn't getting high or drunk. And so in that two years, God just kind of discipled me. And I began to sort back through my journey, wondering, God, was I really saved at six? Or did I just do some religious thing? And here's what I've discovered as I've read through Scripture. When the Spirit of God steps out of heaven and into your heart because you surrender your life to Him, nothing on this planet can change that. He will never leave you or forsake you. He Himself says that nothing and no one can pluck you out of His hands. 
I truly do remember the drawing power of the Spirit of God on my life at six. And so here's, here's how you know whether or not you truly know Christ. If you can live in sin and continue to get drunk and high and sleep with your boyfriend or girlfriend, and all you care about is someone finding out or getting caught, you don't know him. But if you do those things or you make a mistake and you feel this miserableness on the inside, this conviction, and you've already trusted him as, as your savior, then you know him. That's the spirit of God that lives inside of you telling you yeah. this yeah. is the old life. This is no longer your life. I died to pay for this stuff and set you free. Why are you still walking in it? Amen. So that's how you can know whether or not you truly know him or not. So fast forward. That was, that was right when I was 21. I start helping out in the student ministry and fall in love with working with teenagers and watching their lives change, challenging them to memorize scripture and to walk with God and watching them do amazing things like what I was sharing with you this afternoon. And so I get married, I finish college, I get married, we go to seminary thinking I'm going to be a youth pastor forever and I was for a long time. And I watched God change teenagers over and over and over and over again. So I'm at this, the, the last church I served was in Atlanta. It was a really large church. And I've been there about six years. I mean, we're seeing teenagers saved. We just built this $7 million student facility that they let me kind of help have a part in designing. I mean, everything is going perfect. And God says, step away from all of that. And man, I had this crisis, another crisis of, of faith. And so... God had been, at, at, at that particular time, it was the front of the passion movement. This was back before Chris Tomlin wore leather pants. Um, you know, everything was kind of just organic, and it was raw, and, and college students and teenagers were just gathering in open fields and praying to God for revival in our nation and seeking the Lord and worship and all of that stuff kind of has evolved and come, become really polished now into the passion movement you know, conferences and so forth. But back then it was pretty raw and organic. And our student ministry was being affected by it. And we would have our, our normal hour and a half long service on Wednesday nights and it would go two and a half hours. And I couldn't get teenagers, big football players off of the floor, all piled up, wailing and crying before God, confessing their sin with their girlfriend and trying to get their lives right while parents are lined up outside ready to pick their kids up and they're mad at me for going too long. And I would be home for two hours on a Wednesday night and teenagers would call me and say, hey, Chris, I'm on aisle nine at Walmart. Just led three people to the Lord. I'm telling you, God was working in the lives of these students. And so worship was happening, overseas missions was happening. Both of those experiences were changing our students' lives. They said they came to me as the student pastor and said, Chris, can we stop playing these silly games and doing dumb jello skits and stuff? Will you just train us to share our faith and cut us loose on our campus? I was like, uh, yeah. Less work for me. I love it. And so long story short, God had me step away. Um, well, let me, let me tell you this piece. This is important because I think seeing what God does when you say yes to him is important. We were hosting a conference, a student life conference tour in our church. There were 3,000 teenagers in the building. Louis is uh, speaking on worship is your life. We had just been through worship. It was powerful. I mean, God fell on the place. My entire youth group ended up at the altar. And I was there with them, and we were frozen in the presence of God. Now, this is a Baptist church, a Southern Baptist church. Frozen in the presence of God. I can't pray for my students. I can't pray over them. I can't bend my knees. I can't do anything. But in that moment, God just dropped an encyclopedia, a Wikipedia full of info into my heart. And, and oddly enough, he said, Chris, I want you to learn to play the guitar. And I'm like, what? And I looked up and I saw the band on stage and he said, I have things I want to say to this generation and I need moments like this and I want to use you to do this. Sounds like a really superficial type of thing to hear from God, but I want you to know that it was real. So I had my teenagers 
teach me 12 chords on the guitar, and I drove my wife and my neighbors crazy on the back patio for the next nine months, learned the guitar, began to lead worship on Wednesday nights with our students, and it was pretty rough at first because, you know, you sing at a different rhythm than you play the guitar, and you have to stare at your hands, and then it got pretty smooth, and then it got really good, and then other churches started asking me to come and lead worship. So I stepped away, I resigned. Scariest thing I've ever done because I'm married with two kids. I got real bills and God was asking me to do something a 20 year old who lives out of a backpack does. I stepped away. I began to lead worship on the road with a band full time and I did it for 12 years, 200 plus days a year on the road. At the same time, I began to leverage that environment to say, you know what, worship is not the end all. Worship is the fuel for missions. Worship is about pursuing, it's about pursuing the heart of Christ. When you pursue the heart of Christ, you discover that the heart of Christ is for the world to know him. So true worship is not going to be about what happens here. It's going to be about what happens on the mission field. It's going to be about what happens as you pursue his heart and you realize he came to reach the world, to seek and to save that which is lost. And so your worship if you're truly pursuing him, you're going to be doing what he does. And he left the comfort of heaven, came to an unreached people group who didn't ask him to come. We nailed him to a cross. He rose from the grave. He set us free and then says in his very last words before ascending to heaven, now you go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And I'm with you till the very end. That's, that's him. So all of that to say, God took me on this journey. And, and in leading worship across the country, we began to send teenagers all over the world on mission to say, hey, if you want to flesh this worship out, let's go get on the mission field. And we watched God change the world through teenagers sharing the gospel. Just this year alone in Guatemala, we had 423 individual salvations in remote villages where there's no church, no gospel, no Bible. Crazy. People are hungry for the gospel. And I'm going to talk more about that in, this, in the morning uh, during our short uh, Devo time together. But I want you to tell, I want to, I'm telling you all of this to tell you that there is a cost to following Jesus. This is not something you fill your head full of information and hope that your good outweighs your bad in the end of all of it. That's called religion. Religion sends people to hell. Jesus hates religion. He looked at the religious leaders of his day and called them a brood of vipers, whitewashed tombs, blind guides who speak the language of their father, the devil who's been a liar from the beginning. Religion does nothing for, and listen, let me tell you the difference between religion and Christianity, okay? Religion, whether it's Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism, whatever it is, any system of belief is about man doing good things, following a plan, following a five, you know, pillars of Islam, an eightfold path of wisdom for Buddhists and whatever. You know, it's like, it's about uh, achieving moksha, whatever. All of those systems are about man earning favor by doing good things so they can work their way up to a relationship with God. Christianity is about God coming down to man and setting him free. See, there's not enough good that you can do. You can't pray enough. You can't go to church enough. You can't go to enough retreats. You can't read the Bible enough to earn any kind of favor with God. Because your good stuff, listen, about number one, the Bible says there's none that are good, only God. Number two, it says all of your righteousness is like filthy rags. So if you're hoping that the good stuff you do, the effort that you make, the fact that you're not as bad as the next person, you're hoping all that outweighs your bad on the day that you meet, you know, your maker. Let me just tell you, that good stuff gets moved to the bad pile. And you end up with zip 
on the good side in front of a holy God who is going to ask, why in the world should I let you into my heaven? It cannot be by your merit. It can't be by your works. So I want to read this passage to you. I want to tell you one more story, and I want to challenge you with something. This passage in Luke, the heading on it is called The Cost of Being a Disciple. If you've not read Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book, The Cost of Following Jesus, a uh, pretty powerful book uh, by a studly man who says when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. On the front end of a relationship with Jesus, there's a bloody death, yours. Your hopes, your dreams, your plans, your agenda, your life. Anyone who comes after him, let him take up his cross, deny himself, and follow Jesus. The cross is an object of execution. It'd be like our modern-day electric chair. It's like grab that and walk with it so everyone publicly knows you're, about to, you're walking to your death. So there's a bloody death required on the front end of you receiving new life because there was a bloody death required on the front end of the payment for your sins. So I want to read this section to you. I just want you to listen to it because I know you don't have your Bibles with you necessarily and it's pretty dark out there. So listen to this. In Luke 14, verse 25, it says, Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said this, If anyone comes to me, and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and he's not able to finish it, everybody who sees it will ridicule him saying, this fellow began to build, but he wasn't able to finish. Or, suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? And if he's not, he'll send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same, listen, in the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Now this is in red. This is Jesus' words. And he's saying, if you don't give up every single thing you have, you cannot be his disciple, which means you cannot call yourself a Christian. So I'm at this church in Atlanta I'm wrestling with what God's telling me to do is he's telling me to step away and trust him. And man, I'm, I'm really struggling. And I'm having this crisis of belief like, are you really asking me to do? I mean, like, I love music and I love leading worship, but God, I don't even read music. I'm not even trained in it. I don't even look like a worship leader. I mean, I just like, I'm so unqualified for this. I'd rather hit somebody than lead them in a song. He's like, God, I'm not the guy. And he just would not leave me alone. So I'm late. We get done with Wednesday night one night. We're laying in bed. And um, we put the kids to bed. We're laying there. And... My wife can tell I'm struggling. And she, she says, Chris, why are you still here? I said, you mean like here? She's like, no, not here. But like, why are you still at this church as the student pastor? I said, well, hon, I, I mean, I want to make sure that y'all are taken care of. And she said, that's stupid. <laughs> and just fell asleep. <laughs> Thanks, women. I mean, like, got to the point and fell asleep. Well, completely stunned me. Like, I, my wife is like this kind, practical, in-the-box kind of person. I'm none of those things. And she doesn't normally talk like that. But she just said, well, that's stupid. And went to sleep. 
So I'm like, it stunned me. I'm wide awake. It's 11 o'clock at night. I lay there another hour thinking she's going to wake up so we can talk about this. And she doesn't. She's just snoring away. I cannot go to sleep. So I get up. I put my clothes on. I grab my Bible. And I went to Waffle House. Thank God for Waffle House. Amen. Heck yeah. So I'm at Waffle House. I grab me some eggs and bacon and a big old, I like bring the whole pot of coffee. I'm going to need this. And I'm sitting there and I'm reading the word and I'm praying and I'm saying, God, what in the world is going on? Even my wife thinks I'm stupid. What are you telling? You're telling me to do this thing is crazy. Somehow or another, I ended up in Luke chapter 14. And that heading, the cost of being a disciple, captivated my eyes. And I read that. And when I got to verse 33, in the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. That was the shot through my heart. I closed my Bible. I said, okay, okay God, you're either God or you're not. I'm trusting you. And I closed the Bible. I went home. I waited for my wife to wake up and I told her what had happened. And I said, honey, I'm resigning. And we're going to trust God. And I don't know what it looks like. And I'm scared to death. And that was 17 years ago. And God has provided our income ever since. We've not had to sell cars or cut off cable. We've, God's just provided everything we need according to his riches and glory. But it cost me a secure paycheck and full benefits. It cost me everything I had trained for. I mean, I went to seminary and did my MDiv all to be a youth pastor for the rest of my life. And God asked me to do something that I wasn't even trained in. What's God asking of you? See, some, some of you underestimate who you are so bad that you're just kind of hanging out and riding life out. You know, you're just like doing whatever comes along at the time because you don't think much of yourself. You have no idea that the God of creation has more thoughts about you on a daily basis than outnumber the grains of sand on the seashores of this world. Can you count those grains of sand? Uh-uh. That's how many thoughts he has about you. You are so unique. You are so loved. And you are so purposed in why you are here that if you could catch a small glimpse of what God has planned for you, it would stop you in your tracks and make you take a deep breath and a gulp, and you'd be questioning some things too. God, there's some stuff in my life that's got to change. So those are three major change points in my life. At the age of six, when I trusted Christ with my life, I wandered from him, but he called me back at the age of 21. And then several years later as a student pastor, when he asked me to jump out of all the security and safety that I knew. And it's one thing for him to ask me to do that because I can live out of a backpack and sleep on the floor. I can Eno camp with Jesus all day long. But I got a wife and two kids. And I'm supposed to be taking care of them. And that makes it a whole lot harder to take a leap of faith. So it was the scariest thing I ever did. But God has honored himself. What's it going to cost you? I'll tell you what it will cost you. Everything. You see, you don't get to heaven except through Jesus. Jesus himself said in John 6, 44. If you ever notice this, when you read the Gospels, the larger the crowds get, the harder Jesus' teachings get. Because he knows what's in the heart of man. They just want stuff. Whether it's food or whether it's healings or whether it's miracles. They just want stuff from him. And you love Jesus for the stuff he gives you or for him? 
Because you don't deserve anything. We don't deserve anything but death and separation from God. Not only were we born into sin, David said, Surely I was sinful from the time my mother conceived me in the womb. At the point of conception, you inherited this contamination called sin. And you're separated from him. And sinful man and holy God cannot mix. Add to that all the willful things you've done, the lies you've told, the lusting you've done, the stealing, the cheating on exams or tests, the sharing of homework, all the different things you've willfully done get added to the fact that you're already separated from God when you're born. And holy God, who has no mixture of error or sin in him, can't have anything to do with sinful man. It's like oil and water. The two don't mix. You can pour them into a glass and stir them up, but they're going to separate because they're two separate substances. So it is only when man's sin is removed, making man holy, that then holy man and holy God can have a relationship together. And God knew that the only way for that to happen would be to send his son, the only one qualified. There's a, there were a lot of dudes that died on the cross. I mean, I was in Rome last year, man, and in the in the uh, Hippodrome, man, they used to they used to uh, shish kebab Christians on these poles, impale them, and light them on fire to use them as their nighttime lights, like these little lanterns along the side here, while they sat down at a table and ate. All these Christians are burning alive. So he knew that man can't rescue himself. The only one qualified to make payment for man's sin is a man who is completely holy. And the only man in existence, past, present, or future, that qualifies as holy is Jesus, who was born of a virgin, who lived a sinless life, was tempted in all ways like you and I, but without sin, died on the cross, buried, rose on the third day, now seated at the right hand of God with all authority in heaven and on earth given to him. And he says, if you want to follow me, you got to give up everything. Because I didn't give you 97.5% of my life. I gave you 100%. He demands 100%. That bloody death he laid down requires a bloody death on your part in order to get into the kingdom of God. You know the Nicodemus story, religious leader, curious about Jesus, so he sneaks over at night and says, hey, Jesus, uh, you, I hear you talking about the kingdom of God. How do I get in? How do I get into the kingdom of God? I love what Jesus said. He said, you can't. Not unless you're born again. Now, this is a smart dude. And he says this, you mean I got to crawl back into my mom and be born again? He's like, no, you're born once of blood and water. Think about that. Mom's water breaks, a lot of blood involved, but a baby comes out and we got new life. You're born once of blood and water, but you must be born of the spirit. And so at that point where you lay your life down, he resurrects you, brings you to life. His spirit comes to live inside of you. Your nature changes. Your entire world changes because you were a dead man before and now you're alive. And he seals your future by placing his spirit inside of you, sealing your inheritance in the saints. Nothing can ever change it, not even you. And then your, your end is heaven and forever with him. Jesus, in John 6, right after he walks on, feeds the 5,000, walks on water, tries to get away on a boat, goes to the other side of the lake, and all the crowds show up. So he said, he's, this is what I'm talking about. When the crowds get larger, he, he, gets, he teaches harder. He tells the crowd, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can't be my disciple. So they think he's talking about cannibalism. And they're like, this is a hard teaching. In, the, in that, that section, it says, many disciples desert 
Jesus. Everyone trickles away, and the only people left are the 12. And Jesus says this to him. You guys want to leave too? Finally, Peter said something smart. He says, Lord, where else are we going to go? Who else has the words of eternal life? And I catch this. This is what Jesus says. He said, that's why I told you. No one can come to the Father except through me. You don't get to heaven through Islam. Muhammad on his deathbed was asked by his daughter, Dad, are you going to go to paradise? And he said, I don't know. It's still up to Allah. So my question to my Muslim friends and among the refugee community in Nashville where we train and launch young people and college students to the nations, is do you want to follow a guy that doesn't know where he's going, or do you want to follow a guy that says, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. You can't get to God. And all these, it's, like, it's not like spokes on a wheel, they all lead to the same place. Uh-uh, Jesus himself said, you can't get to the Father except through me. And he said, you can't even come to him unless you give up everything. So here's my question to you. I need you to be gut level honest with yourself as to whether or not you know him or you don't know him. Now I realize in a setting like this, this is tough because everybody in here is assumed to be somewhat of a Christian. And let me tell you this, nobody's gonna stand next to you on the judgment day. Your mom, your dad, your youth pastor, your teacher, your principal, no one is going to stand next to you and vouch for you when you stand before God and answer to him for all the deeds done in the body. You will stand alone and you will answer to him. Those who know Christ have been covered by his blood. He's going to look at them and going to recognize them. He's going to say, enter into my rest. And those who haven't, he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. And you will be cast into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. If we believe this book is real and true, there's only one way to God. There's only one way to have a relationship with him. And that's by Jesus Christ and surrendering your life to him. Dying to yourself so that you might have life in him. There's not another way. So I'm going to ask you to be gut level honest with yourself. No heads bowed. No eyes closed. Everybody looking around. And I'm going to ask you to determine whether or not you know him. You see, as a preacher's kid, I've watched a lot of these moments. And the music plays. And we have everybody bow ahead. And we give you this easy end to slip your hand up. Uh-uh. We don't need any more wimpy people calling themselves Christians. Mm -hmm. If you can't stand in a room or a place like this where people will celebrate you trusting your life to Christ, you'll never stand in front of a world that'll hate your guts for it. So I'm going to ask you to be honest with yourself. If your heart is jumping out of your chest right now, and that means the conviction of the Spirit of God is on you, revealing to you that you don't know Him, I'm going to ask you to trust him with your life in a moment by standing to your feet in front of everybody. I want to make it as hard as I can because then I will know that you have died to yourself to trust him. We don't sneak in the back door of heaven by slipping your hand up. Now, I'm not shaming anybody that, that does an invitation that way. I'm just saying for me, I just know that if you can't stand in a room or in a place where people will celebrate you, you'll never stand in front of a world that's going to ridicule you and pound you to death to live like they live. God created this world. Here's the gospel. This is the good news. He created everything and he created you and me to have a relationship with him. You and I gave God the middle finger and said, no thanks, I'll do it my way. That's a, that's a crass way of saying it, but that's exactly what we've done. We'll do it our way. So we fell out of relationship to God. We've inherited that fall from our parents all the way, handed down from Adam and Eve, all the way to us. 
We're separated from him and cannot have a relationship to God. God sends Jesus, his son, to the rescue. He straps on the Uzi 9 millimeter, comes down, kicks the devil's butt on the cross, rises from the grave, proves his power over death, hell, and the grave, and says, I got the keys to hell, and all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. If you trust me, if you want to follow me, I'll give you new life. That's it. That's the sum total of the Bible. Creation, the fall, rescue, and restoration. And you see the length at which Jesus went in order to restore you back to a relationship with him. If God is revealing to you right now in this moment that you don't know him, you know all about him. Listen, Romans 10, 9 says this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. It takes head and heart. You can know everything. Listen, I had a colonel in the military when I was in the Air Force. I had a colonel who had chapters and chapters and chapters of the Bible memorized. And as he would quote it, he would mix it in with GD and F this and whatever. Didn't know God. But he knew a ton about scripture. It doesn't matter what you know. It matters what you believe. Now, it does take the knowledge of the gospel, and I just shared it with you. But you got to believe from your heart, and then you'll be saved. So I want to pray for us, and when I say amen, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to count to three, and if you know that you know that you know in this moment that you need to trust Christ with your life, I'm going to ask you to stand on, to your feet in front of everybody. It's going to take guts. It's going to take you being a real man, a real woman. But it's time for the kids to sit down and for the men and women to stand up. This is not a game. You have family members on their way to hell. You have friends on their way to hell. You have people in your school on their way to hell. This is not some game. So I'm going to pray for us, and I just want God to reveal himself to you. And if nobody stands, I'm good with that, because I don't, my identity is not tied to who responds. I just want God to be lifted up in this place. And if he's drawing you, I'm asking you to have the faith, the guts, to believe that he will set you free. So Lord Jesus, God, I, I, I'm just grateful that you have revealed yourself to us. I'm so thankful that you came to set us free. I'm thankful for the students in this school, God, who are here to set aside time to be not only with each other, but to hear from you. And I'm asking right now, I'm pleading with you, Lord, by your spirit, would you reveal yourself to these students? Would you expose those in this place who don't know you, God, and would they surrender their life and trust you with everything? For the prodigal who does know you like I did, who isn't living for you, would you break their heart and draw them back to you? And for the faithful in this place, God, would you just inspire them and encourage them to live wide open, unashamed and unafraid so that others might see you lifted up in their life? So God, I'm asking you right now, for those who don't know you, would you save them? And would you give them faith to trust you and lay their life down? And I ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said. Amen. One, two, three. Stand to your feet. Amen. Wow. Amen. That's what, look, listen guys. This is what real men and women look like. It takes guts to do this. Now listen, I want to be clear. I'm not asking you to rededicate your life. I'm saying if God has revealed to you that you know a lot about him, but there's never been one day of true surrender to him. I'm, that's what I'm asking. I'm asking you to stand to your feet. Is there anybody else? Amen.
Amen. I'm not
puts his mask on, puts his uh, oxygen tank, uh, his mouthpiece in, and they head into the house, into the flames. They run upstairs. They finally went, make their way through one bedroom and then another bedroom and finally find uh, a baby crib and they see uh, a child wrapped in a blanket and so they, they grab this child, put it underneath their uh, outer coat or their, their uh, outer jacket, their fireman's uh, coat, and they head downstairs. The house is starting to collapse. Beams are starting to, to fall down. They finally make it down the stairs, out the front door, dive onto the lawn with this child, and the house collapses behind them. But they made it. And so the fireman stands up, and he goes to this mom, and he hands this mom the baby, and when she pulls the blanket back, it's a baby doll. And that child, the real child, died in that fire. Now those firemen were convinced that they had the right thing. They didn't hear another, they didn't hear the baby crying inside. They thought they had the right thing, the real child. And they were sadly mistaken. And they were willing to risk their life even for this child, but got it wrong. My challenge to you guys, y'all are only here for a day. My challenge to you is are you living your life for the wrong thing? Are you giving everything to something that doesn't matter? That something to something that is gonna burn in the end when it's all said and done, you're in trouble. All the good stuff, the Bible says. Your righteousness is like filthy rags. If you're hoping, like the Muslim, like the Hindu, like the Buddhist, like the Mormon, like the Jehovah's false witness, that at the end of your life, all your good hopefully is going to outweigh your bad. Let me tell you something. The Bible says your righteousness is like filthy rags. It gets moved to the bad pile. You end up with nothing in the good pile. And here you are standing before a holy God who demands that everyone give an account for the deeds done in the body. Every careless thought, every careless deed, every website you visited, the things you do in the privacy of your room that no one else knows about. God knows it all. And he came to seek and to save those who were lost. And he said, there's nothing you can do to rescue yourself because even the good stuff you try to do gets moved to the bad pile. You end up with nothing on this scale of good and evil and you stand unholy before a holy God. Now, let me ask you something. Have any of you ever tried to mix oil and water together in a, in a um, yeah. It's like you've helped your mom cook or something and they mix oil and water. Look, you can put them in the oil and water in a glass and stir them up and try to mix them, but they end up separating. Why? Why? Because the makeup is different. It's two separate substances. So oil and water are not the same, they separate. Oil is a little lighter, so it'll float to the top. Same is true spiritually, listen to me. God is holy, completely sinless, no mixture of error. Man, you and me, we're born sinful, and we are also committing willful sins. So holy God and sinful man are like oil and water. They cannot mix two separate substances. And because you and I are stuck, not able to connect with God because we are, are two separate substances, God's holy and we're sinful, then ultimately there's no chance for us to have a relationship with God. And God knew that. So he sent Jesus to rescue us from us, from our sin. And it had to be removed. Listen, there were a lot of dudes that died on a cross in the Roman era. They perfected execution.
Crucifixion was, was known to be the most excruciating form of capital punishment. It put you through an elongated period of pain. But there were a lot of dudes that died on a cross. So what made Jesus different? The fact that he was fully God and fully man. The fact that he was born of a virgin. The fact that he did not inherit the contamination of sin that is handed down to me and you at birth. Because he was of God. He had a flesh. He, he had a body. But he was, in essence, he was fully God. And so he lives this sinless life. He dies on the cross. He rises on the third day. He's the only person in the history of the world who has never committed a sin. And so the only way you can get cleaned up, like if, if you've ever played mud football, somebody else who's muddy can't clean you up. And you can't even clean yourself up. You can take a towel and try to wipe yourself off, but you can't get yourself clean. You've got to get in the shower or under a hose to get yourself clean. And you can't clean your life up. You come to Christ and he cleans it up. And so the only way for holy God and sinful man to have a relationship is for man to be made holy. And the only way that's going to happen is if God himself comes and pays the penalty for our sin, removes our sin, then making us holy. And now holy God and holy man can have this relationship because they're the same substance, right? Does that make sense?